on this day tonight. Pope goes the weakest link after 33 days. Mold breaks bacteria in shocking lab discovery. And Conqueror takes a boat to England and forgets his parking permit. Plus, coming up, why a chicken crossing the road is actually a metaphor for a grown man trying to leave his parents' basement. Those are the headlines. I need a pay raise. News bang. The light at the end of a twisted newsreel. 1978. The Vatican was thrown into chaos today as Pope John Paul I was found dead in his papal pyjamas, just 33 days into his new job. The pontiff, who had barely finished writing his to-do list, reportedly succumbed to a heart attack, leaving the Catholic Church in a state of holy panic. Eyewitnesses report seeing the Pope's lifeless body being wheeled out on a golden gurney, still clutching his unfinished crossword puzzle. Sister Mary Immaculate, who discovered the body, said, I thought His Holiness was just really into his morning meditation. Turns out he was communing with the Almighty a bit more directly than usual. This unexpected demise has resulted in the first year of three popes since 1605 leaving Vatican gift shops with a surplus of outdated Pope bobbleheads and I Heart JP1 t-shirts. The College of Cardinals is now frantically searching for a replacement, with some suggesting they might install a revolving door on the Sistine Chapel for efficiency. Conspiracy theorists are already having a field day, with some claiming the Pope was assassinated by a rogue order of ninja nuns, or poisoned by his own mitre. Vatican officials, however, insist it was just really bad luck, and possibly a dodgy plate of holy ravioli. <coughs> 1928. Scottish biologist Alexander Fleming has unleashed a terrifying new biological weapon upon the world. This so-called penicillin is said to ruthlessly slaughter billions of innocent bacteria, leaving a trail of microscopic carnage in its wake. Eyewitnesses report seeing Fleming cackling maniacally in his laboratory, surrounded by festering petri dishes. It's alive! It's alive! He reportedly shrieked as he watched helpless colonies of Staphylococcus aureus wither and die. Medical experts warn that this new antibiotic could lead to a world where people no longer die from infected paper cuts or mildly septic wounds. It's unnatural, declared Dr. Reginald Leach advocate for traditional bloodletting therapies. How will we maintain the delicate balance of humours if we can't rely on a good fever to burn out the evil spirits? Meanwhile, bacteria rights activists have taken to the streets, demanding justice for their single-celled brethren. Bacteria are people too, chanted one impassioned protester, before being carted off to the nearest sanitarium. Hedrine, 1066. Breaking news from the south coast of England, where a fleet of 600 ships has just landed at Pevensey Beach, ruining the day for local sunbathers and ice cream vendors. The invasion force, led by a man calling himself William the Conqueror, claims to be here to take over the country and install a new management team. Eyewitness Ethel Codswallop said, I was just about to tuck into my 99 flake when these hairy Frenchmen started pouring off their boats. One of them tried to nick my ice cream, but I gave him a good whack with my walking stick. Local authorities are advising residents to stay calm and carry on with their normal Saxon lives, but to expect some changes to the language, cuisine and aristocracy in the coming weeks. News bang, the ray of reason in the mist of uncertainty. For a special weather report on the return of Typhoon Zangsain, we turn to our eccentric meteorologist extraordinaire, Shakanaka Giles, who's been tracking this tempest from his treehouse observatory. Well, well, if it isn't a blast from the past. Looks like we're in for a bit of a typhoon throwback, folks. Grab your umbrellas and batten down the hatches, because Typhoon Zangsane or as we like to call it, Typhoon Milenio, is making a comeback. Expect the skies to open up like a leaky faucet over in the southeast. With rain so heavy, 
it'll feel like someone's emptying their bathtub right on your head. And if that's not enough, the winds will be howling like a pack of rabid hyenas, strong enough to send your garden gnomes into orbit. But fear not, dear weather watchers, for this isn't our first rodeo. The Philippines and Vietnam have seen it all before, and they're ready to weather the storm. Just don't forget to stock up on candles and canned goods, because the power might go out quicker than a politician's promise. In summary, batten down the hatches, grab your wellies, and get ready for a wild ride. Typhoon Zhang Sein is back, and it's bringing the drama. And that's all the weather. Hedwin, 1066. William the Conqueror has landed on English soil with a formidable armada of 600 ships. The beaches of Pevensey, Sussex are now teeming with Norman invaders, marking what experts are calling a bit of a kerfuffle in English history. This unprecedented beach party threatens to redefine the very fabric of English society, from its language to its aristocracy. One can only wonder if the English nobility had adequately prepared their beach defences. For more on this developing story, we go live to our Norman invasion correspondent, Brian Bastable. Brian, are you there? What's the mood on the ground? Greetings, esteemed audience, as I, the illustrious Brian Bastable, a battle-scarred reporter for Newsbang, bring you a live report from the beaches of Pevensey, Sussex. The year is 1066, and I find myself in the midst of a fiery battle between William the Conqueror, a man of formidable military might, and the Anglo-Saxon forces... As I stand here with the smell of gunpowder and the cries of fallen soldiers filling the air, I bear witness to the arrival of the Normans and their fleet of 600 ships. These warriors, each carrying a thousand tales of valiance and death, storm the shores with an intensity that threatens to set the sea aflame. In this deafening chaos, the Norman archers take aim, releasing a shower of arrows into the sky. I watch, my heart pounding, as they rain down upon the English, their armor no match for the sharp tips of the invaders' arrows. Blood is spilled, and the beach is drenched in the red of fallen soldiers. But the battle does not end here. No, this is but the opening act in a bloody play of ambition and power. William, the unrelenting leader, leads his cavalry into the fray. The thundering hooves of his horses strike terror, into the hearts of the English. Their spears and swords clash, and the carnage is both majestic and ghastly. The English put up a gallant fight, but the Normans' superior equipment and battle strategies prove too much. The tide of battle turns, and the Anglo-Saxons falter. I see the fear in their eyes as they scramble to retreat, knowing full well that the path they tread will lead to certain death. In the midst of this gory scene, I see William the Conqueror himself. He sits tall and proud upon his steed, his sword stained with the blood of the defeated. With this conquest, he has taken the first steps towards becoming one of the most influential rulers of the Middle Ages. As I bear witness to this moment in history, I am reminded of the brutal and fleeting nature of war. So much bloodshed and destruction, and yet here I stand, just a humble reporter, my quill in hand, as I recount the story of this battle. So let it be known, on this day, the 28th of September, in the year of our Lord 1066, that the Normans, led by William the Conqueror, have begun their conquest of England. And as I step over the twisted remains of weapons and fallen soldiers, I am filled with a newfound respect for the men and women who fought and died here. This, dear audience, is the grim reality of war. And as I, Brian Bastable, deliver this report from the war-torn shores of Pevensey, I urge you to remember the sacrifices made by so many, for in the end, it is those stories that truly matter. 
And now as I gaze upon the carnage and the setting sun, I shall take my leave, my words carrying the weight of the fallen. For I am Brian Bastable, and this is my duty. 1975 And on this day in 1975, London's culinary scene was served a dish of chaos as a botched robbery at a posh eatery spiralled into a six-day hostage crisis. Three bumbling bandits, claiming ties to black liberation groups, held restaurant staff at Fork Point, demanding political concessions and presumably better table service. Scotland Yard deployed their finest minds and gadgets, including a forensic psychiatrist who presumably psychoanalyzed the criminal's menu choices. The ordeal ended peacefully, but not before sparking heated debates on militancy, policing, and the proper way to pair wine with hostage negotiations. For more on this gastronomic standoff, we go to Ken Shit. Ladies and gentlemen, strap in for a tale of pasta, panic, and piss-poor planning. The year was 1975, and three half-baked dipshits thought they'd hit the culinary jackpot by robbing the spaghetti house in Knightsbridge. But faster than you can say, Mamma Mia! Their half-assed heist turned into a six-day hostage clusterfuck that had London's finest scratching their heads and reaching for the Pepto-Bismol. These three stooges, Franklin Davies, Marius Mather and Alf Townsend, claimed they were fighting for black liberation. But let me tell you, the only thing they liberated was their own common sense from their thick skulls. They barricaded themselves in the restaurant's storeroom, probably realizing that armed robbery pairs about as well with fine dining as ketchup does with caviar. For six long days, these meatballs held the staff hostage while the boys in blue outside played peekaboo with fiber optic cameras and consulted more shrinks than a neurotic millionaire. It was a regular three-ring circus, with more tension than an overcooked rubber band. When the dust settled, two of these geniuses surrendered, while ringleader Davies decided to play Russian roulette with his own gut. Talk about bringing a gun to a pasta fight. In the end, this farce of a felony left us with more questions than a philosophical debate in a room full of stoned college students. Was it politics? Was it greed? Or was it just three idiots who watched too many heist movies? One thing's for sure. After this debacle, the only thing these jokers will be robbing is the prison commissary. This is Ken Shit, reminding you that crime doesn't pay, but it sure as hell makes for some spicy meatballs of a story. Good night, and go fuck yourselves. 1542 And now? A historical tidbit that's sure to make waves. On this day in 1542, Spanish explorer Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo became the first European to set foot on California's sun-kissed shores, landing at what we now know as San Diego. For more on this groundbreaking historical event and its implications for modern-day beach volleyball, we go to our American correspondent, Melody Wintergreen. San Diego, California, the year is 1542, and the waves of history are crashing onto the shores of the New World. For it was on this very day that the legendary explorer Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, the first European to set eyes on this sun-kissed coast, came ashore with his fleet of Spanish galleons. Cabrillo, a man of vision and valor, was commissioned by the Viceroy of New Spain to map this uncharted territory and uncover its secrets. And uncover he did, as his crew braved treacherous seas, battled raging storms, and made first contact with the native Kumeyaay people. Stepping onto the pristine sands of what would become San Diego, Cabrillo and his men were greeted by the wary gaze of the Kumeyaay, who had inhabited these lands for millennia. The air was thick with tension as the two cultures collided, each unsure of the other's intentions. But Cabrillo, ever the diplomat, extended the hand of friendship, seeking to understand this new land and its people. Over the course of six days, the Spanish explorers catalogued the bounty of this coastal paradise, the towering cliffs, 
the lush forests, the abundance of wildlife. Cabrillo's meticulous records would become the blueprint for future Spanish colonization, guiding the crown's ambitions to expand its empire across these uncharted shores. Yet, the journey was not without its perils. Cabrillo himself would succumb to injuries sustained in a skirmish with the Kumeyaay. His dream of mapping the entire California coast cut tragically short. But his legacy lived on as his crew pressed on, their discoveries paving the way for Spain's eventual colonization of this verdant land. So as the sun sets on this historic day, we bear witness to the birth of a new chapter in the story of the Americas. For Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, intrepid explorer and visionary, has left an indelible mark on the sands of time. Melody Wintergreen, Newsbang News, from the shores of San Diego. Under Newsbang, bringing light to the shadows of delusion one fact at a time. And now, for an environmental report more harrowing than a field of sunflowers being bulldozed to make way for a car park, it's Penelope Windchime. Penelope, what eco-nightmares are plaguing you today? Oh, the agony. Tonight, viewers, we lament the anniversary of a truly barbaric act, the first aerial circumnavigation of our precious planet. Yes, on this day in 1924, four American airmen returned to Earth, having encircled our fragile globe in their noisy, polluting, flying machines. Imagine the devastation, viewers. Those fragile contraptions spewing noxious fumes across our pristine skies, disturbing the delicate balance of nature with their thunderous engines, scaring innocent birds out of their wits. And for what, viewers? To prove they could? To boast of human dominance over nature? It's a travesty, a blot on the very soul of Mother Earth. This has been Penelope Windchime urging you to stay grounded, embrace the earth, hug a tree, and for the love of all that is green and good, avoid air travel like the plague. <clears throat> D. 1928. Calamity Prenderville brings us a tale of mold, miracles, and British ingenuity. Calamity, enlighten us on this fungal phenomenon. <laughs> Good evening, science enthusiasts. Today we're diving into the mouldy world of British innovation. On this day in 1928, Scottish scientist Alexander Fleming stumbled upon penicillin, quite literally growing in his lab. Now, some might say it was a happy accident, but I say it was pure British ingenuity. Fleming, inspired by his grand's famous blue cheese, decided to leave his petri dishes out for a fortnight's holiday. Upon return, he found a miracle growing amidst the mess. Using cutting-edge technology, a magnifying glass nicked from his nephew's detective kit, Fleming observed that this fuzzy intruder was bullying the bacteria. Aha! he exclaimed. We've got ourselves a proper bacterial bouncer. But how to harvest this miracle mould? Enter the patented Fleming Fungus farming facility, a modified airing cupboard rigged with a BBC micro for climate control. Soon, penicillin was being mass-produced faster than you can say, God save the Queen's sinuses. Of course, there were challenges. Early trials on pigeons in Trafalgar Square led to an unexpected side effect. The birds developed impeccable British accents. But fear not, this was quickly resolved with a spot of Earl Grey. Today, penicillin continues to save lives, all thanks to British innovation, a bit of mould and a very long holiday. Remember, folks, sometimes the best discoveries are growing right under our noses, or in this case, in our dirty dishes. This is Calamity Prenderville, reminding you to keep your lab coat on and your petri dishes dirty. You never know what you might grow. Erdo News Bang bringing honesty to the truth one fact at a time. 1963 And now, 
a seismic shift in the art world that's left critics positively gobsmacked. Roy Lichtenstein's WAM has exploded onto the scene at New York's Leo Castelli Gallery, leaving onlookers either dazzled or utterly bewildered. This colossal diptych, featuring fighter planes and comic book explosions, has single-handedly redefined the boundaries of what we dare call art. Some say it's a masterpiece. Others claim their five-year-old could do better. For more on this artistic upheaval, we cross to our culture correspondent, Smithsonian Moss. Now at this point of the evening, we welcome listeners on FM who've just joined us. Waho, Newsbang Nation, gather round, I've got a doozy for you tonight. Straight from the swinging 60s, when art was all about blowing things up, literally. I'm talking about Roy Lichtenstein's iconic masterpiece, Wham!, the OG comic book-inspired explosion that detonated the art world back in 1963. This diptych dynamo debuted at the legendary Leo Castelli Gallery in New York City, where the cool cats and hipsters of the time congregated to witness the birth of pop art. And what a birth it was. A massive two-panel painting that depicted a fighter plane blasting another aircraft to smithereens. Complete with bende dots and primary colors, that would make a kindergarten teacher weep with joy. Now, I know what you're thinking. What's the big deal about a painting of an explosion? Well, my friends, this was no ordinary explosion. This was a nuclear blast of creativity that shook the foundations of the art world, sending shockwaves through the establishment and cementing Lichtenstein's status as the king of pop art. But, let's get real, folks. WAM wasn't just about art. It was about the zeitgeist. It was about the Cold War, the Space Age, and the impending doom that hung over the world like a bad acid trip. It was about the commodification of war, the banality of violence, and the increasing detachment of modern life. And yet, amidst all this existential angst, WAM managed to be... Well, kind of fun. I mean, who doesn't love a good explosion, right? It's like the ultimate guilty pleasure. The artistic equivalent of a Big Mac and fries. So, there you have it, folks. Wham! The painting that blew the lid off the art world and paved the way for all the wacky, zany, and just plain weird art that followed. And if you don't like it, well, that's your problem, pal. As the great philosopher, Ferris Bueller once said, Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. Word. The News Bang, Truth's Cathedral, Fiction's Funeral Pyre, 1978. And now, a look back at this day in 1978, when the Vatican experienced a papal predicament of biblical proportions. Pope John Paul I, the smiling pontiff, checked out of the Holy See after a mere 33 days in office, leaving the Catholic Church in a state of divine disarray. The Vatican's revolving door spun faster than a cardinal's cassock in a windstorm, marking 1978 as the year of three popes. Conspiracy theories swirled like incense, but official reports insist it was a simple case of holy heartburn gone horribly wrong. For more on this ecclesiastical exodus, we go to our religious affairs correspondent, Pastor Kevin Monstrance. Good evening, my cherished congregation. Before we begin, I must share with you the most peculiar thing that happened to me on the way to the studio tonight. I was accosted by a rather insistent chap who claimed to be the long-lost third cousin of Pope John Paul I. He was quite adamant about it, waving around a family tree that looked suspiciously like a spaghetti dinner. <laughs> when I politely inquired as to his proof, he proudly declared, I have the same nose, and promptly honked it twice for emphasis. Well, who am I to argue with such ironclad evidence? 
Speaking of papal peculiarities, I'm reminded of the time our dear producer, Martin Mozzarella Bang, decided to take up a new hobby, Vatican conspiracy theories. Poor old Mozza became utterly convinced that the Vatican was hiding a secret cache of alien artefacts in the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> he even tried to organise a covert mission to liberate the truth. His plan involved disguising himself as Michelangelo's David and sneaking in during a guided tour. Thankfully, we managed to talk him out of it by pointing out that the fig leaf might not provide adequate coverage for his, shall we say, holy trinity. <laughs> but I digress. Tonight, we gather to remember the life and legacy of Pope John Paul I, whose papacy was tragically cut short after just 33 days in 1978. It was a tumultuous time for the Catholic Church with three different popes in a single year. The last time that happened was way back in 1605, a year so long ago that even my jokes were considered fresh and original. <laughs> now, some of you may be wondering, what exactly is a myocardial infarction? Well, it's a fancy medical term for a heart attack, which is what sadly claimed the life of Pope John Paul I. It's a sobering reminder that even those closest to God are not immune to the frailties of the human body. As the saying goes, man plans, God laughs, and the Vatican scrambles to update the papal stationery. <laughs> In fact, I once knew a priest who was so worried about his own heart health that he started a strict regimen of daily exercise and meditation. He would spend hours in the church garden performing yoga poses while reciting the rosary. It was quite a sight to behold. A man of the cloth contorting himself into positions that would make even the most flexible of saints blush. He claimed it was all in the name of spiritual and physical well-being, but we all suspected he was just trying to impress the cute new nun who had taken up residence in the convent next door. But back to Pope John Paul. His sudden passing sent shockwaves through the Catholic world, and conspiracy theories began to circulate almost immediately. Some claimed he had been poisoned by a secret cabal of cardinals who opposed his reformist agenda. Others suggested he had been abducted by aliens who mistook his white papal robes for a sign of interstellar peace. <laughs> Personally, I think the truth is much simpler. The poor man simply worked himself to death trying to memorise all the names of the Swiss Guard. Have you seen those helmets? It's like a sea of human-sized Q-tips. <laughs> In the end, Pope John Paul II's legacy is one of humility, compassion and a deep love for the Church. He may have only served for a brief time, but his impact was felt far and wide. As we remember him tonight, let us also remember the importance of taking care of ourselves, both physically and spiritually. And if that means occasionally skipping the second helping of communion wafers, well, I'm sure God will understand. <laughs> now, if you'll indulge me for just a moment longer, I have one final story to share. It's about a young priest named Father Salvatore, who had a rather unusual habit. Every night before bed, he would kneel down and pray for a sign from God. But instead of asking for guidance or wisdom, he would simply say, Lord, if you want me to become Pope one day, please send me a sign, preferably in the form of a giant flashing neon arrow pointing directly at the Vatican. <laughs> well, one night, as Father Salvatore was deep in prayer, a sudden gust of wind blew through his window, knocking over a stack of books on his desk. As he went to pick them up, he noticed that the books had fallen in a very peculiar pattern. They spelled out the words, go to Rome, in big bold letters. <laughs> Father Salvatore was overjoyed. He took this as a clear sign from God that he was destined for greatness. He immediately packed his bags and booked a one-way ticket to Rome, eager to claim his rightful place as the next Pope. <laughs> but when he arrived at the Vatican, he was greeted with a rather different reality. Instead of being ushered into the papal apartments, he was handed a mop and bucket and told to start cleaning the floors. Turns out, the Vatican was in the midst of a severe staffing shortage, and they were desperate for any able-bodied person to help with the janitorial duties. <laughs> Poor Father Salvatore 
spent the next three months scrubbing toilets, mopping hallways, and polishing pews. He kept waiting for his big break, for someone to recognize his divine destiny and elevate him to the papacy. But alas, it never happened. <laughs> Finally, after months of backbreaking labor, Father Salvatore decided to cut his losses and return home. As he was packing his bags, one of the cardinals approached him and asked why he had come to Rome in the first place. <laughs> Father Salvatore sighed and said, I thought God was calling me to be the next pope. I saw a sign that said, Go to Rome, so I assumed it was my destiny. <laughs> the cardinal chuckled and replied, My dear boy, that wasn't a sign from God. That was just the title of a travel brochure that fell out of your book stack. Next time... Maybe try praying for a more specific sign like Become Pope Now or Free Trip to the Vatican First Class Accommodations Included. <laughs> and with that, Father Salvatore returned home, a little wiser and a lot more humble. He realized that sometimes the signs we think are from God are really just our own wishful thinking. And that's okay, because in the end, it's not about becoming Pope or achieving some grand destiny. It's about serving others with love and compassion, just like Pope John Paul did in his all-too-brief time on this earth. <laughs> so let us remember him tonight, and let us strive to follow his example in our own lives. And if we ever do see a sign from God, let's make sure it's not just a misplaced travel brochure. Thank you, and good night. <laughs> Just time to glance at tomorrow's headlines. The Times lead, with Brits smash through Hindenburg Line in Battle St. Quentin Canal. The Guardian opt for Big Soviet Bang at Mayak causes radioactive chaos. There's a map there of the surrounding area. The Mirror. Why was my rabbit banned from the number 74 bus? The Express. Pop goes pansy in flower, arranging disaster. And finally, The Telegraph. Three sisters make jumper from sheep they stole. Well, that's all from us tonight. Do tune in tomorrow for more news bang. Same bang, different news. Tune in next time for more artificially intelligent hilarity. News bang is a comedy show written and recorded by AI. All voices impersonated. Nothing here is real. Good night.